Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan to stay in grey list of FATF till October 2020. US State Department report calls out Pak for being a terror hub. Pakistan draws flag from India for being a terror sponsor country. Pakistan's inherent views on terrorism exposed as PM refers Bin Laden a martyr. And Taliban ramp up attacks on Afghan security forces ahead of intra-Afghan dialogue. Failing to impress FATF with its pseudo steps of combating terror financing, Pakistan has once again been asked to stay in the grey list of FATF in the second plenary meeting of FATF held virtually this week. Its failure in curbing terror funding and hence terrorism has repeatedly frustrated the counter-terrorism efforts of agencies and countries trying to get rid of this menace. The decision of sustaining Pakistan into grey list comes in the wake of Pakistan's unfulfilled commitments at FATF and its non-compliance on its recommendations. We have a detailed report. Giving no relief to Pakistan on terror financing charges, the Financial Action Task Force or FATF in its latest plenary decided that the country would remain in the grey list of FATF for failing to comply with the Global Terrorist Financing Watchdog's deadline to prosecute and penalize terrorist financing in the country. The decision to keep Pakistan in the grey list was taken at the Global Terror Financing Watchdog's third and final plenary held online because of the coronavirus. Pakistan's apparent inability to check terror funding to groups like lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed among others are the reasons that have sealed its fate in the grey list of FATF till October 2020. Pakistan should be placed on the blacklist as far as the FATF is concerned. However, they had the support of China, Turkey and Malaysia which has kept them out of the blacklist. That notwithstanding, I think it is a very positive development that Pakistan continues to remain on the grey list as far as the FATF is concerned. Uh, even remaining on the grey list, uh, there are uh, certain penalties and uh, certain costs which Pakistan has to bear. And the longer they stay in the grey list, uh, the better it would be for the world community. In June 2018, Pakistan was put on FATF's grey list and given a 27-point action plan to implement in order to be taken off the list. Failing to deliver on 22 out of 27 targets, Pakistan was indicted in October 2019 by the terror financing watchdog. In February this year, Pakistan sustained on the grey list of FATF as the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force reviewed reports from Pakistan on the action taken to curb terror financing by Prime Minister Imran Khan's and found many gaps in Pakistan's delivery on its 27-point pledge. Informed sources suggest Park's progress on its action plan would now be evaluated in the next FATA plenary meeting to be held in October 2020. At least till then, Park will continue to be on the grey list and even thereafter till February 2021, even if it completes all its action plan items by October 2020, as an on-site visit by FATF team would have to be held to confirm completion of action plan before it could get out of the grey list. As far as terror financing is concerned, Pakistan is unlikely to change its behaviour uh, over the next few years. Uh, one of the reasons basically is Pakistan depends upon these terrorists uh, to carry out um, their specific tasks as strategic assets, both in Afghanistan and in India. And uh, should it desist from doing so, then these very elements are likely to go against Pakistan. So they find themselves today in a catch-22 situation. If they cease to help the terrorists, uh, that is the Afghan Taliban and the certain groups which they have created against India, like the jaish e mohammed and the lashkar e taiba uh, then they run into a different set of problems. So, um, 
as far as terror financing is concerned, Pakistan will continue to give them uh, at least covert support. They are not likely to curtail their activities, which is why they will continue to remain on the grey list. FATF's decision to keep Pakistan on the grey list came on the same day. The United States in a report said that the country continues to be a safe harbour for regionally focused terror groups. In its annual country report on terrorism, the US State Department stated that Pakistan allowed groups targeting Afghanistan, including the Afghan Taliban and affiliated Haqqani network, as well as groups targeting India, including lashkar e taiba and its affiliated front organizations and jaish Muhammad to operate from its territory. Accusing Pakistan of sheltering terror masterminds, the report further states that Pakistan did not take action against other known terrorists such as jaish Muhammad founder and UN-designated terrorist Masood Azhar and 2008 Mumbai attack project manager Sajid Mir, both of whom are believed to remain free in Pakistan. The US report has simply stated what India has known for many decades. In Pakistan today, there are three separate types of terrorist groups which operate. One is the Afghan Taliban, which Pakistan nurtures and supports and uses as its strategic assets for employment in Afghanistan. The second are organizations which they have nurtured to be used against India, like the jaish e Muhammad, the lashkar e taiba the Hezbollah Mujahideen and others. The leadership of these elements is in Pakistan. Their training and all other facilities uh, are carried out in Pakistan and it is the Pakistan army which assists in the infiltration of these terrorist groups into India. The third category of terrorists in, in Pakistan is the Pakistan Taliban or what they call the TTB, the Tariq e Taliban Pakistan. This is the only group which is fighting against uh, the Pakistani <coughs> establishment because they wish to establish a state based on Sharia. Earlier in its plenary meeting on February, the FATF in very strong words asked Pakistan to swiftly complete its full action plan by June 2020 and warned the country to make significant and sustainable progress, especially in penalizing terror financing. FATF's warning sent a clear message to Pakistan's PM Imran Khan's government that Islamabad must take urgent, credible, verifiable, irreversible and sustainable steps to effectively implement the FATF action plan. Moreover, the country should also address global concerns related to terrorism and terrorist financing emanating from territory under its control. Islamabad has been on the FATF's grey list for over two years now, making it harder for Imran Khan government to access international markets at a time when the country's economy has been faltering gravely under COVID-19 outbreak. Strained relations between India and Pakistan don't seem to be relaxing any soon since Pakistan's support to terrorism is continuing despite several warnings while India stands rigid on its policy of no talks with terror. Islamabad's extensive terror activities in Kashmir and the recent tussle between the diplomatic missions of India and Pakistan have led to escalated tension between the neighbours. The rapid elimination of Pakistan-based terrorists in Kashmir by Indian security forces has frustrated Pakistan to an extent that it is using weapon-loaded drones and its diplomatic mission in New Delhi to accomplish its devious agendas against its neighbour. In order to weaken the terror nexus of Pakistan in India, the Government of India has decided to cut down the strength of Pakistani High Commission by 50% within seven days. Bad news loomed over Pakistan this week as the country received back-to-back -back flag from its neighbour India. While Indian security forces have continued their operations against Pakistan-sponsored terrorists, the country's army stood exposed as a Pakistani drone loaded with weapons and grenades was shot down in Katwa town of Jammu and Kashmir territory by the Indian border security force. On the diplomatic front too, 
Pakistan faced major humiliation as the Indian government decided to cut down the strength of Pakistani High Commission to 50 percent owing to its role in espionage against India and its support to terror activities in Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan Embassy in India, in Delhi, is hub center of all terrorist activities. They coordinate, they fund, they, they uh, provide leadership and provide all, tops, all types of support to the terrorists who are operating either in JNK or throughout India. So they are a nuisance, they are a threat to Indian security. Every time Pakistan tries to inflict harm upon Indian interest, it falls flat on its face owing to the alertness of Indian intelligence agencies and its defence forces. This week too, Indian security forces neutralised around 10 terrorists in different sectors of Kashmir. While three terrorists were gunned down by security forces during an encounter in India's northern Srinagar city of Jammu and Kashmir territory, several others were neutralised in Tral, Sopor and Pulwama districts of Kashmir. These recent bouts of encounters are similar to the Indian Army's operation All Out of 2019, in which more than 160 terrorists were killed. It is not just one particular corner of the region, but the Indian security forces have been preemptively attacking their enemies in all zones and sectors. Since the beginning of this year, we have killed more than 110 terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. Most of these operations are clean operations without any collateral damage on civil property and or military or security forces. This is, all these operations are based on solid evidence being given to the security forces by the civilians who are totally fed up of the terrorism ex-Pakistan. The high-handedness of the Indian security forces over Pakistan's vicious network of terrorism and the country's depleting economy has left the country bewildered. As its trained terrorists are only seeing the face of defeat and death, the money being pushed into the terror network is adversely charging the country. Islamabad's attempts to fund and provide weapons to terrorists are only getting busted at the hands of Indian security forces and this is severely impacting its leftover reputation at the global platform. The shooting down of a weapon-loaded Pakistani drone in Indian airspace is a recent example of its failed endeavours in pushing terror activities in Kashmir. वहाँ की डायरेक्शन से एक हेक्सा कॉप्टर आता हुआ दिखाई दिया। पहले आवाज सुनाई दी, फिर जब इन्होंने ऊपर देखा तो हेक्सा कॉप्टर जो है वो मूव करता हुआ इंडियन टेरिटरी की तरफ एंटर हुआ। जब ये 250-300 गज अंदर आ गया, तो करीब 150 से 200 फुट की हाइट के ऊपर ये फ्लाई कर रहा था। तो नीचे से हमारी पार्टी ने फायर किया इसके ऊपर और इसको मार गिराया। गिरने के बाद में जब इस हेक्सा कॉप्टर का सर्च किया गया, तो उसमें से एक M4 US मेड वेपन सेमी ऑटोमेटिक कारवाइन रिकवर हुई। 60 राउंड उसमें से मिले हैं, दो मैगज़ीन्स मिली हैं, सात ग्रेनेड्स मिले हैं। Baffled by repeated failures, terrorists sponsored by Pakistan resorted to attacking a CRPF party deployed in highway security in Anandnag district of Jammu and Kashmir, leaving one Indian soldier martyred. A child was also killed by the terrorist in this attack. At a time when the countries are making an integrated approach to face the challenge of pandemic COVID-19, Pakistan is still focused on its strategies to spread terrorism across the globe. Pakistani army generals who are the real masterminds behind most of the terrorism across the globe believe that the world won't notice their devious plans amid the pandemic outbreak. But to their surprise, not only all of their diabolic activities are being monitored, but being given a befitting reply by the Indian forces. Viewers, we now have a prime minister in South Asia who regards terrorists as martyrs. For him, Osama bin Laden is not a mass murderer, but a shaheed or a martyr. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, in his latest statement in Parliament, 
referred to the perpetrator of 9-11 attack, Osama bin Laden, as Shaheed. Have a look. Ek waji Osama bin Laden ko inhone Americans ne aake abtaad mein mar diya, shaheed kar diya. Uske baad kya hua? Sari dunya ne hume galiyan nikali. Bura hume ka. Hume bura bala ka. Yani hamara alai. हमारे मुल्क में आके मार रहा है किसी को और हमें नहीं बता रहा और 70,000 पाकिस्तानी मर चुके हैं उनकी जान के लिए। Former Indian diplomat K P Fabian is now joining us for analysing this statement of significance by P M Khan. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan has called Osama bin Laden a shaheed and the Indian media have carried reports thereon. I went to the dawn. I should add the English part of it only, and I found no reference to that statement of Imran Khan. But the Indian media have, uh, of course, uh, reproduced the exact text. Now, to me, this is not very surprising, because don't forget that uh, Imran Khan was called uh, Taliban Khan. He had a certain relationship with them. Moving on to Afghanistan, after months-long stalemate of intra-Afghan negotiations, the Afghan government and the Taliban finally agreed to initiate the long-awaited peace talks last week. However, the chances of peace returning to the war-torn nation are still hanging on a thread as the Islamist group has not put a halt to its offensive against Afghan security forces. The violence has ramped up since the agreement and discord over the release of Taliban prisoners has hampered progress on formal talks. A report. Hopes for a breakthrough in a push to end Afghanistan's grueling conflict have dimmed again amid growing violence in the country. Multiple bomb blasts and attacks are being reported on a daily basis from the war-torn nation. Recently, a Taliban attack in western Badghis province of Afghanistan killed at least 10 Afghan security forces, including seven commandos and three police officials and wounded five others. In a separate incident in the northern Jorzjan province, a roadside bomb ripped through a rickshaw and killed six civilians. No one claimed the responsibility for the attack. However, the Interior Ministry of Afghanistan blamed Taliban for the bloodshed. The latest assault comes as Kabul authorities accuse Taliban of unleashing a wave of violence in recent weeks after violence descended on much of the country following a three-day ceasefire announced in May. There are doubts being raised by the various stakeholders, even by the Afghanistan government, that this peace agreement, this intra-Afghanistan talks, are not going to lead the country to anywhere. The assets, intelligence, the security forces, the law and order machinery, the police forces, and even the peripheral government establishment were attacked in 39 provinces during past one. And that is a kind of uh, uh, warning bell that tolls for, for the entire uh, world and also for the stakeholders of peace uh, who are out to broker peace between the Taliban's and the government uh, with the involvement of United States uh, in Afghanistan. The security situation of Afghanistan has declined from bad to worse in the past few days. According to the National Security Council of Afghanistan, the Taliban group carried out 422 attacks in 32 provinces during the past week, killing 291 security personnel and wounding 550 others. In the same period, the insurgents are accused of killing 42 civilians, including women and children, and wounding 105 others. Also, about 60 civilians in central Afghanistan were kidnapped by the Taliban over the past week. In another revelation, the UN mission in Afghanistan released a report raising concerns about 15 attacks on health workers and healthcare facilities during the coronavirus pandemic, attributing responsibility for the majority of them to the Taliban. 
The spokesman of National Security Council of Afghanistan said that the Taliban's commitment to reduce violence is meaningless and their actions inconsistent with their rhetoric on peace. The accusations come as the insurgent group and the government inch closer to potential peace negotiations posing an immediate threat to upcoming intra-Afghan talks. Spokesman for the Afghanistan, Javed Faisal, had clearly mentioned it that this is meaningless exercise because gun and the peace cannot go together. His comments was very clear when he says that it's not going to reap anything to the Afghanistan because because they are not consistent with the with their policy of uh, leading towards peace. The insurgents onslaught made for the deadliest week in the history of the 19 year long conflict but it hasn't stopped the US from pushing for a peace deal. Recently, the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation, Zalmay Khalizad, tweeted that both sides should not be deterred and push forward to take the steps necessary to reach intra-Afghan negotiations where a comprehensive ceasefire and a political settlement can be negotiated as quickly as possible. This is what the Afghan people want and we stand with them. The United States say that there is no military solution to the ongoing conflict and has already reduced its troops level under a troop withdrawal agreement with the Taliban in February, designed to pave the way for peace talks with the Afghan government. Under the deal, all American forces are to leave Afghanistan by the end of May 2021. However, that complete withdrawal is conditions-based. That includes a Taliban guarantee that Afghan soil will not be used as a launch pad against the US and its allies, the launch of intra-Afghan negotiations and a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire in Afghanistan. But the continuous surge of violence by Taliban is suggestive of an unchanged stance and strategy of the insurgent group despite all the talks. Only when the Taliban ceases its attacks, the situation of Afghanistan will move towards stability and peace. Mumbai terror attack case has entered into its 12th year, but none of its culprits in Pakistan has been punished yet. The proceedings in Pakistan's Supreme Court have been going on since more than a decade, but the victims of the terror attack are still awaiting justice. However, India is making strong efforts to extradite the remaining perpetrators who have been hiding in different parts of the world with Pakistan's support. In the recent development, American authorities have re-arrested a Pakistan-born Canadian citizen, Tahawar Hussain Rana, a key plotter of 26-11 terror attacks in Mumbai, paving way for his possible extradition to India. Our report. It's been 11 years since the horrendous terror attacks on Mumbai were carried out but the real perpetrators and masterminds who were responsible for the atrocities have still not been brought to justice. Some of them are still roaming free in Pakistan and others have been hiding in different parts of the world with Pakistan's support. However, India at one side has been pushing Pakistan to take severe actions against those involved in the 2008 terror attacks. On the other, it is making strong efforts to lay hold of the ones who planned, funded and orchestrated the attack from Pakistan. In a massive development, Tahavur Rana, a key accused in Mumbai terror attacks, has been re-arrested by US authorities in Los Angeles recently. A Pakistani-origin Canadian Rana was serving a 14-year sentence in a Los Angeles federal prison for providing logistical support to lashkar e taiba and was granted an early release last week because of being infected by the coronavirus. However, he was arrested two days later as he faces extradition to India on charges of murder and conspiracy in the 26-11 attacks. 
This is the first step towards the start of formal extradition proceedings. This uh, uh, arrest of his is definitely going to strengthen India's case. Firstly, because India has been for long demanding that uh, Rana should be sent to uh, India and uh, he should be extradited and uh, we will uh, have a trial in our court and we will ensure that he gets the uh, strictest of the punishment because in the Mumbai attacks more than 174 people were killed and uh, the attacks uh, lasted for many days and uh, in fact this was one of the most horrible attacks uh, in any civilian area that one could imagine for. So definitely uh, his re-arrest uh, is a very positive sign. 11 years ago, 10 terrorists belonging to Pakistan-based lashkar e taiba laid siege to Mumbai over a period of three days, leaving 166 people dead and hundreds of others injured. Though the attacks were carried out in practice by 10 LET terrorists, but there were many sitting in Pakistan giving them instructions on how to cause maximum damage to India. India has been urging Pakistan to bring the culprits of the Mumbai attacks to justice for years, but no severe action has been taken against them. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.